So uh, as I was thinking a little bit about uh, our, our discussion this morning, I was uh, uh, recalling uh, more than 20 years ago when I was contemplating a different career path. I was thinking about being a historian uh, and going and getting a PhD. And at the time, I was interested in colonial and post-colonial history, which uh, was heavily influenced at that time by uh, 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 literary criticism and the idea that animated in part by the idea that there was no such thing as objective truth and that that was something of a construct of uh, Western imperialism. But that seemed a little heavy for this morning. So <laughs> I think maybe we can stipulate that there is such a thing as objective fact. And, and uh, our challenge uh, in the media and as researchers and communicators uh, is to educate uh, Americans uh, and policymakers uh, about these objective facts and hopefully motivate them to use them in a constructive way. Um, I think it goes without saying, obviously, that the, that, uh, the challenge is immense. All of us uh, in the media who covered last year's debate about the Affordable Care Act I think we're horrified at some of the uh, blatant mistruths that were used to justify part of that campaign. Um, but obviously, the challenge is more complex than simply dealing with um, black is white, white is black. Uh, deliberate misrepresentations. All of us in the media, I think, or more broadly, have to deal with how do we convince skeptical people about the value uh, of objective research and fact. And we have, a, I think, a really nice, really good group of panelists here who um, can give uh, each of them a different perspective <coughs> on how they are approaching this challenging environment. So I will introduce each, and then each of them are going to speak for a few minutes and share their stories of uh, navigating uh, through a sea of misinformation and uh, trying to get through to the, those of us who are in the reality-based community. Um, so I'll work down uh, along the list here, along the, to, my, to my left here, starting with Dr. Aaron Carroll. Aaron is a uh, professor of pediatrics and associate dean for research mentoring at Indiana University School of Medicine and director of the Center for Pediatric and Adolescent Comparative Effectiveness Research. His research focuses on the study of information technology to improve pediatric care, health care policy, and health care reform. And in addition to his scholarly activities, he's written about health research and policy for many major media outlets. To his left is Terry Tenelian. She is a senior behavioral scientist at the RAND Corporation, also currently serves as the RAND Health Liaison to the Department of Veterans Affairs. Is a nationally recognized expert in military and veterans' health policy. Her research interests include access to and quality of care for service-connected health problems, military suicide, military sexual assault, military families, and veterans' caregivers. Next is Dora Hughes, Dr. Dora Hughes. Dora is a senior health policy advisor in Sidley Austin's government strategies practice in Washington, D.C. She provides strategic advice to clients across a wide range of issues relating to health coverage, Dora joined Sidley after serving nearly four years as a counselor to former Secretary of Health and Human Services, Kathleen Sebelius, and she is a former staffer to Senator Edward Kennedy on the Health, Education, Labor, and Pensions Committee, and to former Senator uh, Barack Obama. And then finally, my former colleague, Chad Terhune, uh, senior correspondent for Kaiser Health News and California Healthline. He's an award-winning reporter based in Los Angeles, writes about cost and quality of health care and what it means for consumers and taxpayers. Um, I thought we'd start with Chad, um, mainly because I know him best and I can abuse him this way, that those of us in the media are really on the front lines, I think, of dealing with um, a lot of the skepticism out there. My email box certainly testifies to that. Can you talk a little bit about your experiences, um, trying to think about how you get through to readers, how do you communicate uh, in this time of, of skepticism about fact? Sure. Thanks, Noam. Uh, it's great to be here. Thanks for having me. A um, little personal news. Today is my birthday, and I'm very <laughs> happy. <laughs> I couldn't think of a better group of people to share my birthday. <laughs> no, I'm telling the truth. Um, but yeah, it's been a challenging time. Uh, that introduction uh, makes me think, write a story about healthcare and immigration and look at what happens to your inbox. Boy, I get some great emails when I write those stories. That really lights, lights the fire among my readers. Um, but yeah, it's a challenging time. Uh, and you know, will evidence matter? Of course, uh, right now, not so much. 
Um, and there was a lot of talk about optimism a minute ago, and I think eventually we'll get back there, but I don't think it's going to be anytime soon. Uh, so, you know, what can we do uh, going forward? Um, and I think about uh, some of the things as journalists, sometimes it's been some self-inflicted wounds. Uh, I was thinking of a story a few months ago that many of you probably saw about the, uh, the astronaut Scott Kelly and he had been in space for a year at the space station. He came back, they did a bunch of medical tests on him. They were gonna compare him to his twin brother, brother Mark, and NASA put out a press release, and a bunch of people wrote stories about his DNA had changed by 7%. It's like, holy cow, that's an incredible story. His DNA had changed 7%. Uh, unfortunately, that wasn't true, uh, but that story went around the world, went viral very quickly, and then eventually some stories were written about, well, you know, that's scientifically impossible for that to happen. <laughs> and a few phone calls could have ironed that out before that story went everywhere. Uh, but unfortunately, not many people read that second round of stories. Most people read the first round. Uh, and then we've had another example with uh, Time Magazine and the crying child looking up at President Trump an incredible topic, a great story, but then Time Magazine within a day had to issue a correction because that child was not separated from her mother. And as a reporter, that would be a nightmare to write that story and then have to issue that correction. And that hurts. Uh, you know, as journalists, we need to do our part. And as my teenagers would say to dad, you know, slow your roll, dad. Uh, <laughs> we need to take a minute and make sure our facts are right when we go you know, into the marketplace of ideas. So what do we do going forward? I have a few thoughts. Um, you know, one, I would hope everybody here understands, you know, I think we have to play the long game. None of this is gonna fix itself uh, overnight. Uh, I would hope everybody here stays engaged, you know, don't give up. Um, I think all of you here, and I want to thank many of you, many of you here have been my trusted sources for many years. You've shared your expertise, your research, most of all your time, and you've helped me be a better reporter. Uh, and you need to continue to do that, because I think many of you here can help lead us out of this wilderness by continuing to do the hard work that you do, find the evidence, and then share it with people like me. And if you're not sending me your hot news tips, we need to fix that. <laughs> Call me. Not right now, I'm busy, but later call me. Uh, don't, don't call Gnome, just me. <laughs> All right, moving on. <laughs> so I want you to stay engaged. And then uh, in our stories, I think a few things we need to work on. One, I think we need to be more transparent about our sources. Where is our data coming from? And you're seeing that, I think, more in stories of being much more deliberate, taking time of really spelling out where is this information coming from. Uh, you know, was it a claims database of three large insurers across the country, or was it just one insurance company in one state? Was it a study looking at 100 hospitals all across the country, or was it just one hospital in Wisconsin? Or, you know, just how many sources went into this? I think we need to take the time to do a little more hand-holding with readers. And then two, one of the most important paragraphs in any story is what we don't know. I think we need to be a little more transparent about what we don't know. We have all these great findings, we found this out, but we still don't know this. I think that's an important paragraph that I need to write and that we need to talk about. Um, so those are my general thoughts. I'll pass it on. Thanks, Chad. Um, Aaron, you are both a researcher and a communicator. Have you had to adjust the way you think about either one of those two responsibilities in this era? So I, yes, in the sense that, I, that the biggest problem that I think we have these days is it's very hard to break through the noise um, and that there's just news every day. Uh, it used to feel as if there was once in a while something that would happen in the country and that might step on what we were trying to write that day. These days it's impossible to find 10 minutes that doesn't get trampled on by what's going on in Washington. Uh, but, first of all, I want to say it's very impressive that you put together a panel where I'm the least cynical person, I feel, on, <laughs> because uh, I'm still very optimistic about communication and the way that we can get a lot of the things across. I think that the, the big thing that, that people worry about in, in general with getting something wrong in news is when we, we run too fast or we're trying to take too big a leap forward. 
Um, I think often in research, especially in health services research, these are baby steps. We're not, we're not resetting the world with each new study. A lot of it is, here's some new information, let's put that with the old information, let's try to have a better sense of what this all means. And I think if we can carefully do that, we don't have too much of a risk of getting it wrong or, or having to go back and apologize. Granted, I'm, I think I'm very lucky, lucky. I'm also, I think, unique in the sense that I, I'm not a journalist. I'm not breaking news. I'm not you know, trying to be first in anything that I write about. Uh, I get to talk more about the big picture and how this new study sits in with everything else that has come before. And I think that the appetite for that and the market for that has been relatively stable, if not increasing, because I think that slow, steady descriptions of how the world works, how the health system works, how health policy works, I, I think there's a lot of appetite for that, and I think it still has its place even in this loud news world that we live in today. Uh, you're, I think everyone is correct, that it's, it's very easy to, to spout misinformation. It's very easy for that misinformation to get spread all over the world. It's very easy for us to, to have then a misunderstanding of how the healthcare system works or what's going on. But there's still a place for, I think, you know, trusted, steady voices that are constantly trying to describe how things are and how they can be better. And I think much of the work that informs those voices comes from you know, people in this room who are trying to do careful work in, in describing what is going on and, and what we could do in the future. So I, it's, a, it's, it's rough and things have gotten loud, uh, but, I, but I still have a fairly good sense of optimism about that we can all still make a difference in how we talk about these issues. Um, thank you. Terry, you're in Washington. It's, uh, I'm in Washington as well. I find it harder to be optimistic sometimes being in Washington. Do you feel similarly optimistic as a researcher that uh, the, the, the work that is being done can get through the noise? I do. Um, but there are days when I'm certainly very frustrated. And I do live and work in Washington. I've been conducting health services research now for 25 years, and boy, have things changed in that time. It used to be enough to publish in a top-tier medical journal for, to get noticed, for your data to matter, and for people to pay attention, and for maybe someone to actually read it and make some change based upon that. But that's certainly not the case anymore. And so we're challenged, really, in thinking about how to communicate and how to share our findings and how to help individuals understand what our findings mean. In preparing for this talk, I actually looked to um, some of my colleagues' work at RAND, and they had recently coined the phrase that we're living in an era of truth decay. And they characterized this by four trends, which I think are really quite relevant and I've experienced myself in my own work. So I just want to share those with you. The first is that there's an increasing disagreement about facts and data. There's a declining trust in once respected sources. There's an increasing relative volume of opinion over fact and a blurring of the line between opinion and fact. And as uh, Noam mentioned, I have done most of my work over the past 12 years or so in military and veterans health policy. And this is certainly an area where I think I can say the blurring of the line between anecdote, opinion, data, and empirical evidence has been blurred. And those with loud voices and opinions and a fancy infographic from a convenience-based survey are driving policy change and really shaping public opinion in ways that could ultimately be very harmful. So what do we do and how do we counter that? I've worked very hard to kind of think about not just how can I remain rigorous, um, how can I ensure that my work has integrity, how can I work with some of the very best colleagues in the world, and I do say that I have some of the very best colleagues in the world at RAND. They are very smart and passionate about trying to make a difference. And we're okay to take some risks in thinking about how we publish and how we create derivative products that can be useful. But one of the things that I've really tried to do is to think about who are the other voices and how do I influence their attitudes and their beliefs about the work and educate them on how to tell the difference between a convenience-based survey that results in a fancy infographic and a really solidly designed study <coughs> that assess the needs in a rigorous way of a population or to assess how you actually determine if an intervention worked. And so I've had to work very hard to become friends and develop personal relationships with not just members of the media, 
but advocacy organizations, the individuals that um, others are listening to as well, to really think about how to help them understand the research. And this is required for me to get out of my comfort zone, to talk to documentary filmmakers about what the science means for the rates of PTSD among returning service members and troops, and why do scientists come up with different estimates. To talk to um, filmmakers, uh, advocates and the media has been really, really quite critically important in spreading that message and helping them amplify the power of our work and evidence. So I am optimistic, but I think it's going to take a continued commitment to being rigorous, making sure that our science has integrity, and being willing to think differently about how we communicate. We have to hold each other accountable. I mean, in the World Cup days, it's okay to give someone a yellow card. Right? We need to make sure that we are calling into question data when we don't think it smells right. And calling reporters. I talk more on background than I do on new releases. The challenge I have is that many times, most don't have time to read beyond <coughs> the news release. So I feel it's my role and responsibility to help them understand the distinctions and the nuances associated with different approaches so that they can't just, they won't only just interpret my data better, but others' data as well. And working with policymakers, working with those in positions to implement programs is really going to be quite critical. So I do remain optimistic. Um, and Lisa, I'm not sure if I care more if the glass is half full or half empty because I'm confident I know where the pitcher is to fill it up. <laughs> <laughs> thank, thank you, Terry. <clears throat> so, Dora, you have a, a particularly interesting and we might say challenging audience that you have to reach on a regular basis on, on Capitol Hill and in this administration, and it's no secret that there's a certain hostility to some reality-based constructs uh, in that crowd. How, how do you navigate that and have you had to think differently about how you use evidence to, to make your case? Sure, and I, I will start off by saying, I was thinking I, I'm a very pessimistic person, but then coming after Terry and the truth <laughs> decay, I'm like, well, clearly my glass is full. Uh, but uh, I do want to start by thanking Lisa for inviting me to join the panel. Uh, at the time I agreed to do the panel, I didn't realize it was the first panel, and I thought, this is a potentially uh, grim way to kick off a meeting. Um, but I, I do agree that at no time has it been more important to focus on collecting and communicating uh, evidence in an effective fashion if you want to have a true impact on policymaking in D.C., certainly, as well as nationally. Um, as Noah, Noah mentioned by background, I spent six years on the Hill. Uh, both in the majority and the minority. I worked as a political appointee in the administration. Now as part of my current job, I still lobby the Congress and to a much lesser extent the administration. And in some I would say, I, I've seen a lot of sausage making. I've made a lot of sausage. I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly when it comes to evidence. And yet for all of that, in my opinion, I'm not seeing that much of a difference. Communicating evidence, making sure that's used on the Hill, it has always been a struggle. And I it would give the same advice today as I would give it a year ago, five years ago, 10 years ago. I just think that now is even more critically important to follow the recommendations that are out there. This is not a new issue. It's been well studied. There are recommendations. Um, Senator Murray mentioned the commission. I would point out that in March, uh, the Bipartisan Policy Center released two, a two-volume report uh, there's a comprehensive overview of all the challenges with using evidence on the Hill. They talked about you know, staff and experience, the turnover, the procedural and the uh, process limitations. I mean, they laid it all out. And I think that some of that just builds upon what we've always said from the Hill. But at this point in time, we actually have to do it. And that will make the difference. Um, when we talk about, I, uh, going over the reports, I also talked to my colleagues. And so we came up with the, what we want to say the five P's to make sure that my evidence will matter uh, on the Hill, uh, whether in D.C. or nationally. And the very first P is purpose. What was the purpose of your collecting the data? How should it be used? Do you have a recommendation? Then state it. The conclusion should never be the findings. It should be next steps or what's, uh, what are we saying that should be done with that? And I think that that is critically important. Even more important is the second P, that evidence must be compelling. 
And I will have to say, we talk about the Congress, we talk about the staff. Yep, there's no, not many people with PhDs, but at the same time, they do know what a p-value is. They do know what peer-reviewed literature is. They know what compelling, incredible work is. And we have to make sure that we are always there presenting the highest caliber of research when we go to the Hill. But even more important than the quality of the work is who is communicating the work. And this is where I see the health services research uh, uh, fall down time and time again. Uh, it's, it's not enough that you're the expert. You need to be someone uh, that the policymaker knows, personally, ideally, but if they need to be able to trust them implicitly. Are you from a home state institution? Are you somehow able to relate to them, whether it's geographically, demographically, politically, whatever the case may be, but the, the to Terry's point, I completely agree. It's no longer enough to have your paper in one of the best journals. You have to somehow have a personal connection uh, with that office, with that staff, in order for your message to be heard and to be trusted. And I think that's just incredibly important. Um, the third P is pertinent. I, we touched on that. If, if what you're studying, if it's not pertinent to what the, the discussion is on the Hill or what the national conversation is, it's, if it's not relevant, it's not going to get traction. And uh, one of the examples we hear a lot about is people uh, have mentioned the Congress really is not acting on high drug prices. Why is that? And I'm thinking, well, the four, four different committees in the Senate marked up legislation on opioids. Same situation in the House. It's all opioid all the time. Uh, they're not going to take on another big, complex, and painful initiative. Um, the next P is political. You definitely should put on your political hat. Why should the policymaker care? Are they going to win support or are they going to lose support? A politician is not going to vote against its major constituencies, no matter what the evidence shows. Uh, you have to find out why do they care. If we're talking about Medicaid expansion, is it the lives covered? Or is it economic, job losses if the revenue streams are lost for the local hospital? Or is it, you know, some people just have the interest in technology and digital innovation. So find out what matters to that pol policymaker and politician, and that should be used to frame your message. And the final P, I would say, is people. I mean, at the end of the day, it has a start and end with the people. There are certain constituencies that will always be more sympathetic on the Hill. Children, seniors, people with disabilities, people with devastating uh, conditions. Those are, those are the, the groups that will uh, allow you to be more effective on the Hill. And similarly to Terry, will allow you to work with the advocacy groups who will always be more uh, effective on the Hill than health services researchers individually, uh, unfortunately. And I also think that also with people on the back end, if you can mobilize these groups and have them express support and push your agenda, you will definitely become much more effective in the Congress. And so I would say those, all of the, the five Ps, the purpose, is it pertinent, uh, is it political, What's, is it persuasive, and is it people-focused? If you follow those recommendations, and then you'll be much more effective on the Hill. Thank you. I'll hire, hire you for a long time. <laughs> so I, I, I want to pick up actually on, on that last point that you made, because um, a lot of policy in Washington, I think it's fair to say, not just in healthcare, gets, gets driven by personal anecdotes as much as it does by, by evidence. And um, a lot of news actually is created, built around personal anecdotes and stories. Sometimes, I, I, I'd like to say most of the time, stories that accurately reflect some broader point, but, but frankly not, not always. And, and sometimes, as Chad alluded to, stories that that might be the wrong story. But we in the media are, are trained in a way to look for those kinds of stories. Advocacy organizations, I think, are increasingly um, uh, focused on using those kinds of stories. What about in, a, in, in sort of the context of, of doing health services research? Is it appropriate even for health services researchers and people who work in health policy to think more explicitly about trying to identify stories to tell, to make their research uh, get through. Aaron, do you want to start with that? So my editors would say absolutely. Um, they, uh, there's no question that I think when you're when you're writing a column, when you're trying to tell, us to, when you're trying to say something as a journalist, that having uh, some sort of anecdote or story makes it much more compelling. People relate to it; they get it. Uh, the researcher in me absolutely recoils from that in the sense that. 
Uh, I, I, it makes me somewhat nauseous to think that a story or an anecdote is going to drive policy or the way that research is described. So there's, I think when talking to journalists, it probably does help to have a story that illustrates the larger part of, of what's going on or what we have learned. Um, but it is important still, I think, to make sure that the, for me at least, to make sure that the research is, is the main focus, that, that that is really what should shine, that this can be, it can be the way, the hook, the way to get us into the story, the way to make us think about it, but that without the background research and without that being the major component of what we're trying to tell, then anyone else's story can just wipe away what we have already done. And so I, there's no question that I think that, that the stories get used, but the more I think that we can make our research the story, make it compelling, find ways to talk about it in ways that people will care about, uh, that'll be better. Sometimes that has to do with timing. Uh, you know, sometimes we are still fixated as researchers on the press release, and when we're gonna talk about it is the day that it gets published. No one cares. Yeah. Uh, that is not how the world works. And so getting better at talking to, to journalists and reporters about our research when it might be more uh, on people's minds or, or when it is. Like I write about school sleep times every year as school starts. That's when people care about it, not when the research drops, not when the paper gets published. And so trying to, to get better about uh, timing it so that people will pay more attention and the, the stories will come more naturally might also help as well. Terry, do you recoil at the, uh, the idea of thinking about stories in the context of research? Yes and no, but I will say I have deployed it as a specific strategy. So to the extent that uh, we're trying to generate impact and um, attention to the work that we've done, if you can think about a powerful story uh, to add to it, I think it really helps sell that message. And so we released a major study in 2014 looking at America's military caregivers. It was entitled Hidden Heroes. And so as a specific derivative product, we identified um, individual caregivers that would be willing to share their personal journeys in blog posts or to work with us in, in the release. Um, now, we had to do so in a way that protected um, you know, human subjects in ways that we felt comfortable about doing so, but as a specific strategy um, that we used and has been very effective in, I think, mobilizing a lot of the response to that work. Um, that work has probably been one of the most impactful studies I've ever worked on. Legislation was introduced on every single recommendation. There continues to be work done. And I'd like to think I'm pretty good at communicating, but I really think it was the caregivers who refer to the RAND study every time they talk about their journey. And so anchoring it, I think, is really, really critical. I agree that um, making the research, the focus, and teaching these caregivers how to talk about it and how the data was important and really validating their experiences was an important part of our dissemination strategy. And, and Chad, when you think about what sort of think, finding stories, this is something we obviously do a lot of. I know I have thought more in the current environment about what kinds of stories I'm looking for and how to find a story that can reach beyond um, the uh, beyond the, the sort of political biases of the typical reader of the Los Angeles Times on the west side of LA and reaching uh, the big country in between. And that's meant thinking about going to find Trump voters, for example, in, in, in West Virginia or somewhere else to talk about the impact of some of the stories with the notion being that that's different than writing about someone in LA or New York or Boston. Have you thought differently about kind of how, how we find those stories and should we? I think as reporters, yeah, we've all done some soul searching of yeah, getting outside of our normal bubbles of people and uh, really sitting and listening to people because I think we did have kind of like an earthquake in our country and just the light bulb went off that you know the people were really hurting. Uh, a lot of economic, health, uh, anxieties that maybe we did not really understand and we're not communicating very well. So yeah, I think we all were trying a little harder to uh, reach beyond our normal interviews and the normal bubble. Um, on, the, on the other question of examples, uh, I love it when somebody brings me a real life human example, but I think as reporters we have to understand that's the beginning of my work because then I need to go vet that story and make sure that person really fits whatever the story is about. And I think that's often when things kind of fall off uh, the card. Is that reporter does not do that homework 
And you know, sometimes I'll do a background check. I want to make sure this person doesn't have three felonies. Uh, you do not want to be the person who's basically surprised this person is not who they really are portraying themselves to be. Um, and I think the other point I want to reinforce and heartily endorse, uh, the idea of a background interview and you know, reaching out to journalists well before the embargo lifts on your study and just have that conversation and find people who are passionate about the subjects you are passionate about. Because every journalist, we kind of pick and choose things that we're really interested in. So find that person, talk to them, have that long background interview where you're just kind of talking freely and then later maybe move on the record. I want to get to your questions, but one last question for you, Dora. Um, when, you, when you think about using stories and working with advocacy organizations particularly, I know you mentioned this has always been a challenge, but one of the things that has struck me in talking to advocacy groups whom I have sought out precisely because I think they are not your typical, no disrespect to anyone here from Families USA, but families delivering an attack on the Trump administration is hardly going to surprise anybody. But groups like the American Academy of Pediatrics or the March of Dimes, groups that are sort of can seem to have, be ab above the political fray, to my view at least, can be more um, persuasive, hopefully, in helping people get over whatever political biases they may bring to reading news. Do you think about kind of the different places that those organizations play and how that can be used as a communication strategy to, to make a, a fact-based argument? Absolutely. I mean, in my head, if you had five to eight solid patient advocacy organization, we're talking about March of Dimes or the American Cancer Society or, uh, or others of that ilk, five of those on the same position paper will be much more influential on the Hill than one paper in a peer-reviewed journal. Mm -hmm. It is the, 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 the name and the, the strength of the group, but it's also the patient stories that they can bring. And the other important consideration for these groups is that a lot of times they are having to advocate for positions for which there is no data. And so we saw that with some of the ACA implementations. Some of them had early signals from their members that this is not working or this reg is harmful or this needs to be changed. And they couldn't offer any substantial data or anything that we would consider high quality, but still hearing those real world experiences from over and over for thousands of patients across a variety of different groups uh, was enough for us to be very successful in getting some of the regulations changed. Um, and in the AC is just one example, that would be true across a number of other uh, issue areas. And so I think the patient's patient stories are, are gold. And if you could have some of those to augment your findings and to be your face, to add their voice, uh, you could increase your effectiveness by 100%. So we only have a, a little bit of time left. I wanted to make sure there's enough time for folks who are asking questions in the audience. There are, I see, six uh, microphones strategically placed. Uh, someone is at number four. Marshall Chin, oh. Chin from University of Chicago. And so as Noam said, the teaching for communications is to combine evidence with stories, appeal to the heart as well as the head, appeal to emotion and values. Yet we see after the, the past week, even after the immigration debate, that some of the most powerful emotional stories for the crying children, there's a story in the New York Times this morning showing that the level of support among President Trump's base remains stable. And it's also not just the working class, it's college affluent uh, voters also. So the question is, are we missing something in terms of a special ingredient beyond fact and beyond emotion? Or are we appealing to the wrong set of emotions or the wrong set of values in our messaging? That's a really good question. Um, who wants to take a stab at, 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 at how, how we navigate this conundrum? I, 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 I don't claim to be an expert, but having read my colleagues' work on truth decay, um, it really comes down to how individuals process information and whether or not they can accept information that goes against some of their core beliefs and values. And to the extent that we also need to think about how you influence beliefs and values. I mean, my point about documentary filmmakers, I don't necessarily consider them to be, you know, part of my dissemination strategy every time I release a new study. But if documentary films are going to be telling the story of an era of service in post 
I want to make sure that they're using the best data possible and, and telling those stories. And so those stories, I think, again, kind of permeate the way that people learn and accommodate and develop their beliefs and values. So I don't have an answer to this specific problem, but that is one of the motivators that I have for thinking well, about getting outside my comfort zone. So let me just have a chat. I know you want to get in here, but I mean, clearly, there is an evolving feeling, I think, or even research to suggest to support the, the notion that people who have very strongly held views will not necessarily give give up those views even when confronted with direct fact. And that right. sort of goes against what had been a sort of article in faith in journalism that, you know, we do myth busting, we 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 do fact checks, and that's enough to sort of and in fact that research suggests that's very not unproductive. And I've certainly done a lot of thinking about well how do you how do you think differently about how you try to reach a skeptical audience? And I was mentioned earlier going to talk to Trump voters or what have you. But Chad, I, I don't know if you want to address that specifically, but, but the, the challenge here, right, is to try to figure out the right mix to, 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 to get through to people who may otherwise be really, really skeptical of what Kaiser Health News or Los Angeles yeah, Times, so you do. I think it's kind of the best of times, the worst of times. We've been focusing a lot on the worst of times for the past hour. But if you think about it, the ways to communicate, I mean, have just exploded. And I see it with my two daughters. They would never, ever read one of dad's long 2,000 word <laughs> stories. But they will sit there and watch a BuzzFeed video for an hour and a half that is actually very fact-based, is very informational, and they learn a lot. And you know, just think of all the stuff that we now consume, podcasts and you know, documentary films. And as an old-fashioned print journalist, it pains me to say this, but there are so many ways now to get your message out, and we need to think creatively. And they can be rigorous, fact-based, 100% accurate, uh, but we need to embrace some of those. And that will reach some of those people versus my hard-hitting story they will never see and will never read. And I hate to admit it, but it's true. <laughs> so let's go, how about five? Hi, um, thanks for your uh, wonderful talk and a very important um, area. I would like to throw something out um, for your consideration. Maybe you can respond to it. I'm sorry, can you just identify who you are? Oh, sorry, Gail Brecky from Kansas University. So regarding the truth decay, one thing that jumps out at me um, about how people behave now with regard to interacting with each other and talking about these things is that I think we have gotten away from really engaging with each other and having discussions with people we disagree with or people with different backgrounds. Um, and I would hope that we continue to be open the, to the possibility that Maybe some of our assumptions are incorrect or should be reconsidered. Um, I don't know if you've seen the article. Um, it was in March Millbank Quarterly um, by Lawton Burns and Mark Pauley, but it was um, discussing our assumptions that we've made in healthcare and in various initiatives. Um, the article is Transformation of the Healthcare Industry, Curb Your Enthusiasm. And I would recommend that you look at it because I think the idea, or one thing that I got out of it is that, you know, sometimes we make assumptions about how the world works or what sorts of things will work, and they don't actually work the way we think they should. So I think I'm just suggesting that we should stay open to discussing with each other um, what our assumptions are, what our research is, what our methodology is. Um, so I hope you can um, respond Thank to that. Dora, do you want to talk a little bit about this, maybe in the context of, 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 of folks on the Hill? Um, when I went to Washington, it was one of the most striking things to see was the vast diversity of worldview that, that, is, that is in Congress. And that can be difficult to navigate. Right, I completely agree. And as you were speaking, I, I was actually thinking back to my time on the Hill and when we first started, I worked for Senator Kennedy, and of course, Senator Hatch was one of his BFFs. And it was understood the offices would work together despite profound philosophical and political differences. And even more surprising, when I left Senator Kennedy's office when I worked for Senator Obama's office, and we were instructed to work with Senator Coburn's staff. And I was 
they were like, find something we can work on together. And many of us were like, what might that be? Um, but, <laughs> but we did. We worked together. Uh, we worked together well. And we actually became friends. And even just having that foundation of looking through someone else's uh, prism, understanding where they were coming from, and it really just, uh, I completely agree with what she's saying, that that is hugely helpful as we try to take on some of these uh, thorny issues. And um, I have 100% agreement. And, and Ken, let me ask this really quickly of the two researchers here. Is that a challenge in the research, con research community where perhaps there may be more of a worldview that t trends towards sort of one part of the country than, than another? I don't know. I totally agree, though. I mean, how do I stay sane some days? It's like you want to just surround yourself with like-minded people and not have to pay attention to these ideas that don't make a lot of sense to you. But I have to challenge myself to kind of actually interact with people who think differently, who have different uh, views and perspectives, and to try to learn from that and engage and, and educate each other, I think, and come up with healthier balances in how to approach things. You know, in, in the research community, I think we often kind of fall back into that traditional, like, we compete against each other for funding. And so, you know, how do we collaborate in times when we're actually competing against each other for limited dollars and tighter, tighter um, funding environments? And so, how do you develop colleagues that are also maybe not approaching things the same way that you are. I don't ha I mean, I, I seek it. Um, it's challenging sometimes. You have to kind of swallow your pride, but I think it's important. I think, uh, why don't we take a question over here at two. Um, thanks very much. Albert Wu from Johns Hopkins. So the, um, the media is very interested in um, breaking news and getting the story. And uh, individual reporters and papers are reasonably kind of competitive with each other to sort of get uh, the, the latest news and get the audience. On the other hand, we heard a little bit earlier about the importance of playing the long game. And uh, many who, uh, some of us in healthcare and health services research might think of as being perhaps the enemy or at least of having a very different agenda than we do, um, have been very skillful, in fact, at playing the long game. Um, the strategy of attacking the media, for example, and reducing credibility by saying things over and over that are false, in fact, is difficult to combat when you're sort of thinking about things one story at a time. So I wonder if um, members of the panel could comment on how collectively, both folks in the media and uh, researchers and people in the health policy community can sort of play the longer game. Aaron, you want to talk about the so, long game? Yeah, I, I mean, I think part of it is that we underestimate how much uh, journalists in the media want to talk to us, um, and that uh, they, they want to hear this. They might not write about the story the day you call or the day that you talk to them, but they want contacts. They want people they can talk to who can help explain how these things work. I spend an enormous amount of time these days answering emails and talking to journalists just when they have questions about how research works or how, uh, you know, how should I care about this study? Should I not care about this study? And they do that because I've spent years talking to them and, and answering their questions. So I think part of that long game is that we have to be willing, I hate to say ivory tower, but we have to be willing to leave the confines of, of where we are very comfortable and not be so afraid to talk to journalists, especially off the record, I would, I would really endorse that, on background, so that they develop a relationship and then they know when you call, when you finally are saying, this is important, you should pay attention, they'll listen to you. Um, and they need that level of trust. And that is a long, long game. That's a relationship. Chad, do you want to just address this in the little time we have left here? I mean, you've, you've been at this a really long time. Yeah. <laughs> Actually, thanks, health thanks journalists. For that out uh, health journalists. I'm not telling you how old. Happy That's birthday. his birthday. Yeah, maybe some milestone. <laughs> uh, but yeah, well, what was just said is hugely important of taking that time. And yeah, we can be really annoying, and you can kind of you know hang up the phone and say, oh, "Boy, that was a waste of my time." But yeah, you're planting the seed both for your own work, and hopefully, yes, you're serving greater society. Of my stories will be a lot better. Uh, the other thing that people were talking about, I think uh, people were talking about uh, opposing views. Uh, I found last year in the ACA debate, repeal and replace, oftentimes it was just a branding debate. 
like you had individual mandate, auto enrollment. They were kind of like, they were just like doing the same thing, but you know, each one to say it was something wildly different. And like sometimes you had to actually read those bills and like there were actually some good ideas in those bills that like worked like just what was in the ACA, but they just wanted to call it something else. Uh, so I just think again, to take our time and actually break down what these people are proposing and sometimes it is not diametrically opposed. I'm gonna look over at the timekeeper over here. How are we, how are we doing? One more question? Okay, well, how about here at three? Uh, hi, I'm Ben Brown. I'm starting medical school in the fall. And I'm curious what the panel thinks about the dynamic where frequently the people that we think of as died in the wool Trump supporters are actually the people who are hurt in or the losers in health reform efforts that are being pushed by the party that they vote for. So I'm curious if anyone could speak about what happens when people's self-interest and partisanship collides. Who wants to take a shot at that? Dora, you wanna? Whew, that's a hard one. I mean, I think that's what we are seeing over and over and over. And I'm wondering if the current issues with the, with the tariffs, if that will finally uh, drive home the point that you may need to reevaluate your position in light of your own, uh, the impact to your own economic well-being. I, I feel, I feel that in part, I'll take a step back. I'm gonna share a very quick story um, that just happened this past week with one of my colleagues, a very smart person, very senior person who's Republican. And I asked her, like, why, why, why do Republicans hate IOM reports, National Academy reports so much? Which is, you know, I got the expected visceral reaction. And she uh, was once again saying, oh, well, this, it's an elitist group. It's a bunch of old men, sorry, at Ivy League institutions. They're in their Ivy Towers. They have no idea and no experience in the communities that they're actually opining about. That was a pretty much all a direct quote. I mean, there's a lot to unpack there. And a lot of it, you know, I was like, well, how, how can I share that on stage? And she was like, just like I just said it. And I'm like, all right. Um, but, yeah, but when you think about people who are so diametrically opposed, part of it, again, is having those relationships, those ties with people who are actually from those areas. Being able to work with people from Kansas or Nebraska, or Tennessee, Georgia, those are just having those relationships and those conversations and to be uh, in a trusted advisory position, I can't underestimate how important that is. And I think when we have those relationships, that's how we will be able to change the hearts and the minds and truly educate. It will be those doctors and others in the communities who are actually caring directly for the patients that I think can make a difference. Well, on, on that hopeful note, <laughs> no. maybe we should stop. <laughs> but thank you very much. Thank you to our panel. You guys were great. <laughs>